Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all very much for coming along. Um, as you can see, my title today is Mobius and his Band, and I want to use Mobius's work to introduce some important mathematics about surfaces and their properties. So let me give a brief overview of the lecture. First, I'll say a little bit about Mobius, his life and his times. Then I'll say a little bit more about some of his other mathematical work, apart from the Mobius band. I don't want you to think he was a one-sided mathematician. <laughs> I thought I would get it over with her. <laughs> and then next to the main course, to introduce the Mobius band or strip and explain what is meant by the claim that it's one-sided, which was something that confused me for, for many years. So I hope at least to be able to clarify that for you. Well... If you're not confused about it now, you will be after I've explained it. <laughs> uh, this one-sided or non-orientable nature of the Mobius band gives us some strange properties. And I want to introduce a tool called cutting and pasting that can help us to identify those properties. Well, the method I will have used in order to define the Mobius strip, it uses rectangles and identifies the sides of the rectangles in certain ways. And we can use this approach to um, construct another fascinating object, the Klein bottle. And in fact, the technique that I will use is the basis of one approach to the proof of classifying our, uh, surfaces. And I'll mention what that result is at the end. And the final one-sided surface I'm going to look at is the projective plane which originally arose in projective geometry. And Mobius created a system of coordinates that not only described the points of the projective plane the, and the ordinary Cartesian plane, but also a way of describing parallel lines and essentially introducing points at infinity. And this coordinate system has got very many practical applications in, for example, computer graphics. So now to tell you about Mobius. August Ferdinand Mobius was born 17th November 1790 and died 26th of September 1868. And during the course of his lifetime, the pursuit of mathematics in Germany was transformed. In 1790, when he was born, it would be hard to find one German mathematician of international stature. By the time he died, Germany was the home and training ground for the world's leading mathematicians. And the mathematics researched and taught there spread and came to influence the higher mathematical activity of the rest of the world. And the changes weren't not, were not unrelated to the development of the entire German-speaking world over this period, from a gaggle of fairly independent states through invasions, wars, revolutions and other tribulations to an empire united under the political and military might of Prussia. Mobius was born in Schildforte, a community in Saxony between Leipzig and Jena in the centre of Europe, then at a very complex and pivotal time in history. And it was very much an age of transition in the arts and sciences as well as in po politics. And to the west in France in 1790, the revolution was underway, the French Revolution, and was still in quite a progressive phase, supported with excitement and enthusiasm at that time by liberal-minded people all over Europe. In 1806, when Mobius was a 16-year-old schoolboy, French troops defeated Prussia and Saxony at the Battle of Jena, not far from Mobius' home. The shock of this decisive defeat led to an upsurge of patriotism and a renewal of education and of intellectual life. A flowering of national culture was promoted by educational reform, new institutions and new social and professional structures. The University of Berlin was founded three years later in 1809, the year Mobius entered Leipzig University, and Berlin University developed during the 19th century into the leading institution embodying a new research-oriented professional approach to academic subjects, not least mathematics. Leipzig University, which Mobius entered in 1809, is one of the oldest German universities, founded 400 years earlier in 1409. And Mobius initially studied law, his family's choice of subject, but he quickly changed to his preference of mathematics, physics and astronomy. While a student, he visited Gauss, the greatest German mathematician of the day, to study theoretical astronomy. In 1815, he finished his doctoral thesis and in early 1816 was appointed extraordinary professor of astronomy at the University of Leipzig, where he stayed for the rest of his life. 
Now, even though it was called an extraordinary professorship held, which was held by Mobius, it was a somewhat lowly form of academic life, meaning that he was entitled to advertise lecture courses for which he might charge a fee. But he wasn't an especially charismatic lecturer, and apparently students only came to his courses when he advertised them as being free. <laughs> and his progress up the academic ladder was slow. His position was not upgraded to an ordinary chair of astronomy until 1844, and that was only because the University of Jena tried to lure him away. Besides his teaching point, Mobius was appointed observer at the university in eight, at the observatory in 1816. And this was his rank for many years. Although he was finally promoted to director of the observatory in 1848 um, and was eventually promoted to uh, director of the observatory in 1848. Although he spent most of his professional life as an astronomer, he's mainly remembered now, of course, for his mathematical discoveries. Gauss, the greatest mathematician of his age, likewise spent his life as director of an astronomical observatory. And it's very interesting because it seems paradoxi paradoxical to our eyes but, um, that they were both astronomers, but it's partially explained by noting the different social roles of mathematicians and astronomers in early 19th century Germany. When you look at it, a mathematician at that time was essentially a poor drudge whose time was spent pumping basic calculations into ill-prepared, unmotivated pupils. Or if more ambitious, was at best an administrator whereas an astronomer was a scientific professional. Mobius lived a full and academically active life until his death in 1868, which was not longer after he had celebrated his 50th year of teaching at Leipzig. His mathematical legacy has lived not only in the subjects he investigated, them in the subjects he investigated but also in the way he investigated them. So before turning to the Mobius strip, let me look briefly at three other areas to which he contributed. Now, the first one is one of the earliest problems from the area of mathematics now known as topology, and where we are concerned about the properties of shapes that are invariant under continuous def deformation, which, of course, is sometimes known as rubber sheet geometry. So let me share with you the question that Moby shared with his students. Um, namely, once a king with five sons, in his will he stated that after his death, the sons should divide the kingdom into five regions in such a way that each one should share part of its boundary with each of the other four regions. Can the terms of the will be satisfied? So you require that each region has got a boundary with each of the other four. Okay. And the answer to the question is no. And if you had a chance to think about it, you may be able to give an intuitive argument to try to in inform yourself as why. So if you take three of the regions, first of all, and decide how you're going to configure them in order to have a chance of uh, uh, writing down five regions, each of which shares a boundary with the other four, then you're going to try a shape like this with a hole in the middle, because if you don't have a hole in the middle, then you've got, you will have no chance whatsoever of um, being able to have five regions, each of which shares a boundary with the other four. And then if you've got a hole in the middle, there's two things you can do. You can try to put the fourth region, here we've got three regions, A, B, and C. You can put the fourth region inside it, but now you see, where are you going to put the fifth region D? You can't put it right around the outside, or it's not going to reach the shaded region D in the centre. And you can't put it somewhere in the centre, because there's going to be one of the two regions surrounding it that it's not going to have a boundary with. If you have a chance to look at it, you could, can convince yourself of that. The other thing you can do is to try to put the fourth region on the outside of the hole. So let's put the shaded region D on the outside, but now you see that if you put the fifth region in the hole in the centre, it's not going to have any boundary with the shaded region. And if you try to put it around the outside, it's not going, depending on how you do it, it's not going to be either to reach B or to reach C. So the answer to the question is no, but notice that it's a question in topology because it doesn't depend upon the detailed shape of the region. If you were to do these diagrams on a sheet of rubber, on a sheet of rubber, and you were to stretch the rubber, it wouldn't affect any of the arguments that I've only very quickly and briefly given you, you know, and which you can uh, look back on when you get the, um, the handout afterwards. Okay. The second thing, and one that I particularly like, is the 
work that he did on inversion in circles and mappings from the complex plane to itself, but you don't need to know about complex numbers to appreciate the beautiful um, transformations that there are. They're now called Mobius transformations. And I've given three examples of them here on the, the right-hand side. If we look at up here, what we're mapping is the complex plane to itself by um, a transformation by multiplying by a particular complex number one plus i, but the effect that it has upon this network of lines here, rectangular network of lines, is to rotate and to stretch them. Right? And this transformation here, this inversion, one over z, it's got the lovely property that it takes this family of straight lines, a horizontal and vertical straight lines, and converts them into a family of circles. And the little shaded region is shown uh, on the left, and this shows you what it's mapped to on the right. And these two transformations, indeed all of the Mobius transformations, are what's con called conformal, that if you've got two curves in the originating plane, which are at right angles, then their images in the uh, transformed plane are also at right angles. And you can also see another lovely transformation here, where what you can do is to transform the whole right half plane, right half plane, here to the inside of a circle over there. And these transformations are very versatile, you know, very important, and I think also very, very pretty. Right. And the third thing I want to mention is that he also made contributions to number theory, and most importantly, what's now known as the Mobius function. And that depends upon the, the way that an integer is made up of primes and how many primes there are of different types. And that's got various applications in number theory and combinatorics. Of course, none of these examples would have made his reputation, and nor would his work on astronomy or mechanics. But what did was his work on surfaces. So first of all, let me show you an important tool for constructing surfaces out of rectangles. So here we have, and a lot of this lecture is going to be concerned with taking a rectangle and identifying the sides of rectangles in different ways. And I suspect by the end of the lecture, you won't be able to look at a rectangle without a shudder of nervousness. <laughs> so first of all, to get started, let's look at the top left-hand side where I'm going to construct a cylinder out of a rectangle. So the rectangle is here, but I'm going to adopt the convention that the sides that are marked with two single arrows have to be identified, have to be brought together, have to be joined, have to be glued together in such a way that the arrows match up. So if you lift those, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, as it were, lifting them out of the paper, joining them up, then you're going to get, the, before you join them up, you're going to get the middle picture, and then as you join them up, you're going to get the cylinder, which is the right-hand picture. So the crux there is that one's creating this surface here, which is a cylinder, um, which has got two edges, a top edge and a, and a bottom edge, out of a rectangle of paper by identifying two of the sides in a particular way. So that, that's the, the crux of it. Okay. Let's do it with another rectangle, only um, with this rectangle we're going to identify opposite pairs of edges. So with this rectangle down here, what I'm going to do, as before, is to identify the left and the right together, matching the arrows up, but I'm also wanting to identify the top and the bottom, the one with two arrows, matching those two arrows up and getting them going in the same sense, going in the same direction. So what I'm going to do is, this time I'm going to do the top and the bottom first of all, so I'm going to lift, as it were, the top out of the paper, the bottom out of the paper, bring them round, bend them round, join them together, and I'm going to get the cylinder that we have here. So once again, we end up with a cylinder. But now, I have to identify the left-hand end of the cylinder with the right-hand end of the cylinder. <coughs> so as it were, I pull the left-hand and the right-hand out of the plane, as shown in bottom left, pull them out of the plane as shown in bottom left, and when I do that, the orientations are correct, and I glue them together. So looking at this, tri this rectangle here, where we have opposite sides being glued together with the same orientation, ends up giving you a torus or a donut. So the torus or the donut surface is obtained from a rectangle with identifications to the sides. So that's the tool, really, that underlies the classification of surfaces. What you 
coming to the end of the lecture. So if I tell you that, you'll leave. Um, but essentially what one do, the trick is that you associate a surface with a polygon generally and with various identifications to the sides. And then you're able to do the classification down at the level of these polygons. OK, but pretend I didn't say that, so stay for the rest of it. All right, so you've got a rectangle, and I've shown two ways in which you can identify sides in this rectangle. Let's look at a third way. And this brings us to the Mobius band. So here again, we have a rectangle, um, and we're going to identify just one opposite pair of sides, but this time with opposite orientations. So the left-hand one, the arrow is going up. The right-hand one, the arrow is going down. What that means is that when we come to join them, come to glue them, come to combine them, the arrows have to be facing the right way. The same way, I mean. <laughs> um, the same way. So the only way to do that in, in three dimensions is to take your strip of paper, to give it a half twist, and then to bring it around and to connect the two of them together. And when you do that, the arrows are going to be um, oriented in the same direction and we've got a representation of that here on the, whoops, on the right-hand side of the Mobius band. And here are a couple of pictures of Mobius bands, one made out of paper there. And I did think of bringing along a strip of paper for you each to make it as we were going along, but then <laughs> there's an awful lot of cutting to be done on that, and I thought I wouldn't do it. On the other hand, I thought perhaps I could bring you all knitting needles and you could perhaps <laughs> knit a Mobius band as you were sitting listening to the lecture. All right, well, Mobius band is uh, ubiquitous in art. Um, here's a, on the left, very famous drawing or uh, a representation by Escher of the ubiquitous ants crawling around a Mobius band. And the other, which I didn't know about until relatively recently, is of the recycling symbol, which is a one twist Mobius band um, by Gary Anderson, discovered, or rather not discovered, created in 1970. Um, and his original design of the recycling symbol, the recycling logo. All right. Now, the Mobius band was, um, like many things in mathematics, discovered a couple of months earlier by somebody else, Johann Benedict Listing. Um, he was a German mathematician, another German mathematician, who wrote a book in 1847, which contained the first published use of the word topology. And in 1858, he discovered the properties of the Mobius band shortly before and independently of Mobius. And I'm telling you this because it is a tradition to name things after someone other than the first discoverer. <laughs> and this is called Stigler's Law. Oh. Stigler's law is that no scientific discovery is named after its original discovery. And this is where it was postulated in this uh, paper in the Transactions of the New York Academy. But of course, in order for the law to hold, Stigler has to say that, that the, the sociologist Robert K. Merton was the original discoverer <laughs> of Stigler's law. But I think it's not a terrible error to have named the Mobius band after Mobius because he was the one who made uh, a sense of the one-sided property. And you often see the one-sided properties being described that if you start to paint the Mobius band, you know, you'll you paint it, the, it's all the same colour. Or if you start to walk around it, you'll, you know, you'll come back to it on the other side. And I used to find this very confusing when I first met it because I'd also been told that a surface, you know, had no, uh, no depth. You know, so it, shouldn't, it doesn't have one side or another side. Right? There's no thickness to it at all. So how do you go about making sense in an operational sort of way of the idea that the Mobius band is, um, is one-sided? I want to give you three ways of doing that, one of which um, I find very intuitive and the other two which are helpful when you move up into higher dimensions and start looking at um, the topology of shapes of higher dimension than, than surfaces. Right. But all of them I'll illustrate in, in the Mobius context. So first of all, if one's trying to think about what you mean about um, what you may want to mean by a one-sided as opposed to a two-sided surface, what I want you to think about is the observ observation that you know, any point 
on a surface in three-dimensional space, there are two directions perpendicular to the surface. You've got a surface, three-dimensional space, you're at a point on the surface, I'm at a point on the surface in this um, area here, and there are two directions. There's the direction going straight up, which is perpendicular, and there's the direction going straight down, which is another perpendicular. The two of them, one of which is straight up, one of them is straight down. All I'm doing is saying that there are two of them, and I'm giving names to each of them. Right, so let me show you here. Um, on the left-hand side, I'm at a point in the uh, Mobius band, and I've got two normal vectors, we call them, if I may. It's the standard terminology, and I'm so used to it. We've got two normal vectors. That means we've got, at a point on the surface, we've got two directions, which are right angles to the surface. Um, there's one, and there's another one. Here I am on the torus or the donut, and I've got two directions. I'm at a point on the surface on the torus or the donut. There's one direction, and there's another direction. Okay. Now, what's the difference between these two surfaces? The torus of the donut is often said to be two-sided. The Mobius band is often said to be one-sided. Well, the torus of the donut is like the surface of this stage here. If I walk around with my uh, normal vector held up along the surface, well, in fact, I'm a normal vector when you think of it. Um, <laughs> if I walk around this stage anyway whatsoever, but keeping within camera shot all the time, of course, when I come back to where I am, my normal vector is still pointing the same way. So on the right-hand side, if you take this normal vector for a walk, however you like, over the surface of the donut, down to the other side, round about, back and forth, down through there, round again, back here. When you come back to there, the normal vector is in the same direction. Okay. If whatever path you take, the normal vector arrives back pointing the same way, then we say you've got a two-sided surface. Mobius band is different because there is a path on the Mobius band because of its twist. Because of the Mobius band, um, the fact that when you join the two ends together before you join them, you twist them. Here we are, and I go for a walk right round on the Mobius band. There we are. And when I come back to the point that I started with, the normal vector is pointing in the opposite direction. And you can operationally decide upon that. And that is because the, that surface is twisted in space. So that when you come back, the normal uh, vector is pointing in the opposite direction. So the difference, but, uh, and um, it's probably better to go to uh, the standard terminology, which is to talk about whether surfaces are orientable or whether they're not non-orientable. And a two-sided surface is also called orientable, um, and for a reason I'm going to describe in a moment, and the one-sided surface is called non-orientable. So I think that's relatively intuitive. If you had these ant, the ubiquitous ant moving around, carrying a normal vector and a Mobius band, when it comes round to where it started, the normal vector will be pointing in the opposite direction due to the way it lies within three-dimensional space. And that's a nice, sensible, operational way you can talk about one-sided, you can talk about two-sided. So, and I felt very reassured when I read this, first of all, because it, you know, it made sense. Now, that's good, and that will work as far as surfaces in two dimensions are concerned. But it won't work if we move up into um, uh, uh, higher dimensions than three, because the thing is that if you move, let's say, if you've got a curve in, in space, well, there are lots of normal vectors to that curve. There are more than two. There are an infinite number of them. So th it, what I've just said there was very dependent that there were only two vectors to the surface. So let's see if we can get around that. And this really bases, um, this is based on, on the idea of Mobius. What we're going to do is we're going to start by drawing a small circle on the surface. Um, here we are. Let me give you the setting first of all before looking at the picture. We start by drawing... So this is another way of just defining the difference between one-sided and two-sided. And here we start by drawing a small circle on the surface and pick an orientation for it, either clockwise or anti-clockwise. And I like the following analogy. Uh, it's not mine, it's from... Uh, Somebody else. It was important to realise that the surface has no thickness. Imagine it being made of tissue paper and you draw the circle with a felt-tip pen. 
which seeps through the tissue paper so that the circle you draw is visible in both sides of the surface. That's very much a good analogy for half-term week when there are lots of parents doing that with children, um, drawing and making models. So you draw the circle with a felt-tip pen, seeps through the tissue paper so that the circle you draw is visible on both sides of the surface, and you decide upon an orientation for the circle, whether it's going clockwise or anticlockwise. It doesn't matter. You just decide upon one or the other. And here I have with the Mobius strip, I've taken an orientation, I think that's clockwise. And then what you do is you move this little circle along the surface. So you, you don't have to look, you're in the surface all the time. You move this along the surface, and the difference now is, if the surface is such that when you arrive back where you started, no matter what path you took, the orientation is the same, then you're on a two-sided surface, if when you arrive back, the orientation is reversed, then you're on a one-sided surface. And if you look at a Mobius band, here I've done it with the rectangular view of it, and you see here, because of the half twist you have to do to identify the ends, that when you arrive back, the circles will be going in the opposite direction. Here it is on the surface. Here we're starting off, let's say, there, going right round it, right round here, and when we get back, the little circle is oriented going in the opposite direction. So here it was going clockwise and here it is going anti-clockwise. And the advantage of this approach is that you can do it. it. It lives within the surface. You don't have to talk about a normal vector going into some three other dimensions. So that's another way of thinking that um, Mobius band is uh, a one-sided surface that can't be oriented. And now the word orientation seems to make some sort of sense because you're talking about a circle that's oriented in one way when you start off, but then oriented in the opposite way when you come back. So it's non the surface, you say, is non-orientable. So you see why the notation starts to, to make sense. I hope so. And a final sort of way, because... Um, in higher dimensional topology, you're not only concerned with surfaces, but higher dimensional shapes. Um, a third way of thinking about it, but very similar to this, is this idea here. What you do is, at a point on the surface, you put a movable coordinate frame. That is a choice of X and Y, two little short vectors that are at right angles to each other. So here I've got it, uh, one coming down and one going right. So what you do is you have a pair of coordinate vectors at a point on the surface, um, a choice for going up and a choice for going right, let's say. It doesn't matter um, what you pick. And then you just move that little pair of right-angled coordinate vectors around the surface. And again, if you always arrive back with the same orientation, no matter what path you take, then the surface is two-sided. But if you arrive back in a different orientation, then the surface is one-sided. And again, with the Mobius band, if you take these little pair of vectors here, there's one going down and there's one going to the right, and you move this little pair of vectors the whole way round, okay, round to here. When you come back, you find out that the one that was pointing down is now pointing up, and this one here is still pointing in the right direction. So you get a reversal of the orientation. So we've now got three operational ways in which to describe that the Mobius band is one-sided and also to distinguish between one-sided and, and two-sided. Um, so let's see some applications or applications, that's not right, some consequences of this one-sided nature of, of the Mobius band due to this twist that one gives it in, in, in three-dimensional space. And hopefully now you'll you know, you've got an operational way of deciding that the Mobius band itself is one-sided without, I think, this rather vague language of, you know, starting to paint it and it all ends up being the one colour or, or whatever. So let's look at some consequences of this um, one-sided nature. And first of all, I'll go back to something, relative, uh, something more straightforward. And I look at a cylinder and I'm going to bisect a cylinder. I'm going to cut a cylinder along a central curve. Um, that's a pair of scissors going to go round like that there, and it's not hard to visualise that it falls apart into two pieces, and each of these pieces is a cylinder, and each of these cylinders is half the width of the original one. Okay, so what happens when we do the Mobius band? And 
it's surprising that what you obtain is not two separate Mobius, Mobius bands, but um, a single band. Uh, so let me show you. That's it. There we are. So this is the Mobius band here, which I'm cutting around, and it doesn't fall into two pieces. You have to do it in order to convince yourself. Uh, but it gives you a single band, but this single band, in fact, has got four half twists rather than the one half twist that we, we started with. And if something... And it's like a cylinder, in fact, because this one down here has got two boundary edges. Um, something I didn't mention at all was that the, if you were on the boundary of a Mobius band and you're going right round it, there only is the one boundary. If you start going round the edge of it, you come back to where, where you started again. Here, if you cut a Mobius band in two, you end up with something that has got four twists and, in fact, it's got two boundaries. And I'll try. Um, I just wanted to give you a limerick. That's what it was before that. That a uh, mathematician confided that a Mobius band is one-sided and you'll get quite a laugh if you cut one in half for it stays in one piece when divided. <laughs> okay, so what I want to do is, having told you the result when you cut it there, I want to try to justify that um, by a particular technique, and then I want to use that technique before I tell you what the answer is for another cutting exercise. So that, that's the plan of the next few minutes. So let's use our diagrams to try and see um, what happens. So here we have our Mobius band, but I'm going to cut it, and that's the point of the, the dotted line along here. So I want to keep the orientation correct of the um, arrows. So remember what I'm doing is I'm identifying the left side with the right side but oriented oppositely so the left goes up and the right comes down. But since I'm going to cut it I'll have to take care of both halves separately so what needs to happen is that this top bit needs to be identified with this bottom on the right hand side and the bottom on the left hand side needs to be identified with the top on the right hand side. So that's keeping the arrow, the down arrow, the up arrow, but remembering that I'm cutting them across. Okay, so now if I cut them, I get two, two rectangles with this association of arrows on them. So here's an up, here's a down, here's an up, here's a down. And what I want to do now is to make the identifications associated with those arrows. So I think what I do, yep, what I do is I flip I bring them down here, so this is the top one moves over to being the left, and this one moves down to being on the right, just to put them side by side, because what I'm going to do is to flip the right-hand rectangle so the double arrows match up. So if I flip so the double arrows match up, all right, they match up so I can join them together, and these two, when I move them around, hopefully that will remind you of something that's just like a cylinder. That's exactly what we had with a cylinder. What, how you got a cylinder was to join up opposite sides with the arrows pointing the same way. So this is showing that you will end up with something that is like a cylinder. It, it has four twists in it, and unfortunately this argument doesn't tell you how many twists you're going to end up with, but you do end up with something that has got two sides. That's the, the crucial point of it. Or at least it's, it's some way of looking at the technique. So the core idea was we took our rectangle in the way it was identified and we split it up before we had to mark up the sides to take account of the cutting and then we fiddled around with the rectangles that we got in order to match them up according to the arrows and then we looked and saw what we got then. So what I want to do now is a little bit of a test of the technique is to um, look at starting off with a Mobius band, but this time instead of cutting it right down the centre, you start cutting from a third of the way in. So you've got your Mobius band, you start cutting a third of the way in, and if you cut a third of the way in and go right round, what will you eventually get? Okay, so Mobius band in your hand, pair of scissors, start a third of the way in, cut round it, following that line, what are you going to end up with? And I'll show you in a minute, but let's see if we can work out 
what it would be using this cutting pasting technique as just a, uh, a test for how effective it is. Now we're going to cut the Mobius band in three. If we're starting off a third of the way in, we're going to cut it um, three. So we need to do our identification. Now remember, it's up on the left-hand side, down on the right-hand side, but we're cutting it in three. So we'll have this top left identified with bottom right, the middle up with middle down, and then here we have this one here identified with the top right. And we end up with your three rectangles on the right-hand side. Now, when you have a chance to look at them, you'll see that the double-sided arrows only appear in this, the middle one. The double-sided arrows only appear on the middle rectangle. So it's a standalone thing. It doesn't appear in any of the other two. It doesn't have to be identified with either of the other two rectangles. All you have to do with the middle rectangle is to identify <coughs> its opposite sides, but you have to twist them in order to get them around. So that tells us that part of what we get, that middle, that middle one, is going to be a Mobius band. Right. Now, what about the other two? Now, the other two do have to be connected up because there's a single arrow in the top one, a single arrow in the bottom one, a triple arrow in the top, a triple arrow in the bottom. So we need to arrange them to get the arrows matched up, which is what we have done before. So if you arrange them to get the bottom, I've just moved them down here on the left, the top one and the bottom one. And then what I do is I flip one of them to get the arrows matched up. In fact, I flip the top one and then I take this one, move it down to here and join up the arrows. And when you join them up, what you end up getting is a cylinder. And so the result of doing this cutting ends up with two things, a Mobius band and another loop, which is two-sided. So the, the argument doesn't show that they're interlinked, but at least it does show that you're going to get two things, a Mobius band and a loop there, which is two-sided. So it's a reasonably powerful technique of being able to analyse what's going on for these rather complicated and interesting shapes. And it's given rise to lots of work. Let's, let me just show you when, um, as I said, it, you can argue a little bit to show you about how they're interlinked, not. So you just a, a general, you can use exactly the same technique to show when there are two half twists. So a Mobius band is one half twist. If you put two half twists in it, you can use exactly the same argument. If you cut a Mobius band, it has got two half twists in it, use that argument, you'll be able to show that you end up with two other bands, both with two half twists, but interlinked. So you can see that going on. And similarly, if you have three half twists, if you have three half twists here, right, that argument that I've given you will show three half twists is this very nice shape which looks like infinity, or the, the number eight. Um, and if you cut it down the center, what you end up with is a trefoil. Here we are, trefoil knot, trefoil knot. Okay, here, or here's a, another representation of it. And in general, when n is odd, you're going to get one loop with this number, 2n plus 2 half twists, which um, you can show by a kind of induction argument uh, on, the, on the cutting argument that I gave there a moment ago. And probably the nicest way to see this, this is a sculpture by John Robinson called Immortality. Um, so just to remind you of what we had in the previous slide, if, this, if you take a Mobius band with um, three half twists in it and cut it along the center, you obtain one of these knots here. There are other ways of obtaining them. And this is a sculpture that he made of that. Um, and here's an animation of it. Um, obtained, I think, from the Centre for the Popularisation of Mathematics at the University of Wales in Bangor. Um, and in fact, I think Bangor, the University of Wales of Bangor, have adopted this as their, their uh, the mathematics department anyway, have, have adopted this as our logo. So the last little segment I've been saying about was to introduce this technique of um, these surfaces being created from rectangles, um, cutting them in different ways, and seeing how you could get an idea of what was going to happen by matching up the arrows after you'd done the cut 
and associating them and you could at least see whether you were going to end up with um, uh, a Mobius band and a loop or perhaps just with two loops and um, different other... So it's a, a, a technique to be able to, to investigate it. All right. Right, well, I told you that you'd be nervous of rectangles by the end of the lecture, so let me reinforce that by just rehearsing briefly what we've done. Along the top, you've seen it before, that's identifying a pair of opposite sides with the same orientation, gives you a cylinder. Um, in the middle, uh, you identify the top and bottom in the same orientation and the left and right, and you end up with a um, torus or a donut. And down at the bottom, we've got our old family friend, the Mobius band, where you identify a pair of opposite sides, but you give them a half twist. So we need to ask ourselves, or we want to ask ourselves, what happens if we identify a rectangle um, with this orientation given to it? And in this orientation, we're going to identify opposite sides, uh, the top and the bottom, where they're not given a twist, so the top is identified with the bottom in the same direction, but the left and right are given a twist. So, let's do it. Let's identify the top and the bottom. So we pull the top edge out of the paper, we pull the bottom edge out of the paper, and the arrows are both pointing left to right, so we can join them together, so we're going to end up with a, with a cylinder. But we can't do the same as we did before, because if we pull the left-hand end of the cylinder out of the paper and the right-hand end of the cylinder out of the paper, we can't just pull them around and join them together. The reason is because the circles are going in opposite directions. We need to um, change the orientation. And in three dimensions, the only thing you can do to get the arrows mapped up is somehow to pull this, bring it over into the inside and match it up over here. And that's what you have to do, but in, you're not allowed to have the surfaces intersect. So in fact, this Klein bottle um, is not describable, in, it's not constructible rather, in three dimensions. This is a, an artist's representation of it, where what we're doing is we're taking the cylinder we're coming along here, we're having to go inside itself and join up with the other end, inside itself, so that the arrows are matched up. And if you, you know, it's, it's very hard to visualise, I agree. Um, so this Klein bottle, it's not constructible in three dimensions, but um, apart from its sort of beauty, one of the reasons I wanted to introduce it was to, to show how you might start to be able to think about that, and that's using the following kind of analogy. Here, on the left, we've got a pair of lines, and we don't want them to intersect. Now, one way of not making them intersect is to take that pair of lines and to lift one of them up. Start to lift one of them up as it becomes, as it approaches the point of intersection, get it over the point, what would have been the point of intersection, and then lay, lay it down again. So that's moving from the pair of lines lying in two dimensions to think about the pair of lines lying in three dimensions. And you can do exactly the same thing with the Klein bottle. You can think of the, Klein, the, two, the cylinder coming into itself as being not within three-dimensional space, but being within the four-dimensional space in exactly the same way as here. It's impossible to visualise, or at least I find it impossible to visualise, that what you do is that along here, all of these points have got, uh, are given by a pair of coordinates. And what you want to do is to introduce another coordinate that sort of lifts this one up over there and down on the other side. So the Klein bottle, oh yes, we've got a, another limerick. Um, mathematician named Klein thought the Mobius band was divine, said he, if you glue the edges of two, you'll get a weird bottle like mine. <laughs> and to make it even worse, this is really saying that what another way of constructing this Mobius, um, constructing the Klein bottle, is to take, you know, two Mobius bands. Each Mobius band has got a boundary, and to glue those boundaries together. But of course, it, well, I find it impossible. To, it can't be um, represented in three-dimensional space. You need to go up another dimension in order to achieve it. So you've got great admiration for anybody who can do that. Right. So the last sort of segment of what I want to do is to look at. Um, uh, really projective sort of geometry and um, 
the projective plane can be thought of, this is the last surface one to do, by another way of gluing together the sides of a rectangle. But I don't want to look at it that way because that wasn't the way it was introduced. The way it was introduced was um, by means of projective geometry. And projective geometry arose in trying to make sense of parallel lines and the fact that, you know, an obvious um, observation is that parallel lines seem to make meet at infinity. Um, somehow each family of parallel lines seems to be associated with a point at infinity. Is there any way that we can describe this? Is there any way that we can deal with it? And one of Mobius's big successes was to come up with a system of a coordinates that allowed you to do that. And it's really quite uh, mechanical the way that Mobius did it. I'll show you the picture. This is the picture um, illustrating what he did. What you've got is a table. So you've got a table here which is to represent the plane and you've got three holes in the table A and B and C and you've got strings going, you've got a point, a mass here connected by strings going through hole A, going down with a weight at the end. Then you've got a string from P going to B, going down with a, a weight here and then from P across to C going down with a weight there as well. And depending upon what weights you choose, the point P will be pulled around the tabletop. And what Mobius said was that when it, reach, when it reaches equilibrium, then the coordinates that you give to the point P are the three weights that make it end up where it is. So I hope you have the picture now. You have a kind of dynamical system. You can change the weights that you have hanging down. A, B, C here. And... Um, when you change the weights, the point up here will move to a different position. And he said the uh, coordinates you take as those three weights. Now, there are a couple of things I'm sure you're probably thinking about. Um, one of which is that if I had a weight of, let's say, two, three, and five grams, A is two, B is three, and C is five grams, um, that would give me the same point than if I increased all the weights by 10, if I put 20 grams and 30 grams or 50 grams. Or if I were to put two tons, three tons and um, five tons. So that helps to answer the question is, hey, hold on, this is a plane. You only need two numbers to specify a point in the plane. Why do you need three? The crux here is that it's just the ratios that matter. It's not the actual numbers, it's the ratios of the different weights that you have. But it turns out that it's a very good way of being able to describe points at infinity because what you've got is a collection of triples of numbers, and I think I've shown it here. Um, and it turns out that every, shall we call them, every ordinary point on the plane is called a Cartesian point. That can be described by, he calls these, center, these coordinates barycentric because barycenter just means centre of gravity, and that's what you're doing. You're finding the centre of gravity of the three weights. And what he's able to show is that the points in the plane correspond to weights where the sum of the weights is not zero. Um, I should tell you that one of the things he generalises is he allows himself negative weights, which we can think of as little balloons, little helium balloons that are pulling up into the air. But there are lots of other points, there are lots of other sets of three numbers, and those sets of three numbers, what they really do is they correspond to um, the points at infinity. Right? So you've got every point on the plane corresponds to three numbers, A, B, and C. The ones where A plus B plus C is not zero, they're the ordinary Cartesian points in the plane. The ones where A plus B plus C is zero, that's the collection of points at infinity. And I'll show you why and how this is useful here with um, this example, which is why it's called projective geometry. This is our last, last main point, really. If we take a point source of light at L here, and here we have some translucent plane, um, and we're going to shine light from L, and then we're going to see what happens to the images on this translucent plane when they're projected onto another one, we find that a point, P, will be projected to another point, P dash. We'll find out that a line, this line little l, is projected to another line, little l dash. 
So points are projected to points, lines are projected to lines. And in general, a pair of lines will be projected, a pair of lines that intersect in a point will be projected to a pair of lines that intersect in a point as well, but not always. And here's the example of not always. Here we have the point where we're projecting from L, but what happens, and here we have a pair of lines, PN and QN, which meet in the point N, but the thing is that LN is parallel, that line LL is parallel to the plane we want to project it onto. So LN is parallel to the plane we want to project it onto. And if you follow that through or do it, it turns out that when you project the line PN and the line QN, they turn out to be parallel. So that this point here, where they intersect, seems to have disappeared when you do the projection. And if you were to run the rays of light going backwards, going from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, it would appear that a pair of lines here, parallel, which don't project, sorry, which don't intersect, intersect when you project them down back to this point here. Now, ordinary Cartesian coordinates aren't enough to be able to cope with this, this kind of thing at all. Um, but the um, coordinates introduced by Mobius are able to do it. And, and in fact, when you come, if you were to come and look at um, computer graphics, um, these homogeneous coordinates are exactly the framework within which they use computer graphics in order to be able to describe translations and rotations. And then you, put, you, know, you, you move an image around and then you project the result of that movement onto, onto a screen. And the whole shapes before you do the projection are all described in these homogeneous coordinates. But I think the, the thing to take away is that what Mobius did was to end up associating with each point in the plane a triple of numbers. Um, and that seems terribly redundant until you see the benefit that you get is that some triples of numbers correspond to points that can be thought of as being at points infinity. So you're able to algebraically describe all the points in the plane, all the points at infinity, and are able to operate and to manipulate with them. That, that's the, the crucial kind of thing that we have to have to play with there. All right. So these ships that we have can be um, viewed and classified in different ways. And I think the thing that I just wanted to sort of finish off with is that um, what we can think of um, back here uh, with the projective plane, no, it's, it's further on here. Um, here we're coming up to the, yeah, this is it here. Here we're coming up to classification of um, non-orientable surfaces. And when you look at them, we've seen the one on the right-hand side, and this is the Klein bottle here, and the one on the left-hand side is the projective plane, and it also can be thought of as, I'll go back to the slide I just skipped over here to show you, it also can be thought of as a rectangle, I've got it down here in the right-hand side, with opposite sides identified in a particular way. And so that what we end up with, the crux of what I want to say, is that if you take the humble rectangle and with that humble rectangle, you decide that you're going to create surfaces um, by associating and gluing together or connecting together opposite sides, either with or without a twist. In other words, with and without um, the same orientation. If you don't do it with twisting, you tend to end up with two-sided surfaces. If you start to introduce twists, you end up with one-sided surfaces. And it turns out that crucial among these one-sided surfaces is the Mobius strip, because the result, the classification of non-orientable surfaces essentially says that every non-orientable surface can be obtained by taking a Mobius band, a Mobius strip, and gluing it onto a sphere. You take a sphere and you cut out a little disc and where you had the little disc, you glue in the Mobius band. And every two-sided surface can be obtained in that way. And here I've just given you two of them. The projective plane, 
which was that thing that we got with Mobius' coordinates, that turns out to be a sphere where you just glue one band onto it, and here's some image of it, which is very hard to visualise and very hard to understand. And here I've got one, the Klein bottle, where you cut out two discs and you glue the Mobius band in. And clearly there's too much there all at the one time to identify with, so it's important to keep hold of the big idea, and the big idea is that you can relate surfaces to polygons generally, but think of rectangles in particular, with different identifications for their sides. With that way of representing surfaces, you're able to operate with them and being able to classify um, them all completely. And I think I just want to finish then by saying what Ian Stewart felt about um, uh, Mobius when he was summing him up in the book we did on Mobius and his band. And he said that um, about Mobius that his, that his modern legacy was that his mathematical taste was imaginative and impeccable. And, you know, as, as I haven't tried to gloss over really, while he, while he may have lacked the inspiration of genius, you know, whatever he did, he did well and he seldom entered a field, which is certainly true, without leaving his mark. Um, he didn't have a body of deep theorems, but he had a style of thinking, a working philosophy for doing mathematics effectively and concentrating on what's important. And that's Mobius' modern legacy, and we couldn't ask for more. And what I've tried to show you is um, give you an oversight or at least a glimpse or at least a taste of how you can build on the work of this topological curiosity of the one-sided band and to see that it lies at the basis of very much modern mathematics. So thank you very much for your patience and hopefully you will come back for another mind-shattering experience <laughs> with Cantor and his infinities on St. Patrick's Day, Tuesday the 17th of March. Thank you.